Twickenham, where there are no non-essential members <laughs> or visitors. Thanks for coming out to be with us today, and uh, we're glad that you're here. If you are looking for a church home, we would love to talk to you about what God's doing here and tell us what God's doing in your life and see where those stories come together and we can make this journey together. Just glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. There's a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and place it in the collection plate when it passes a little bit later on. And if you have a prayer request, indicate that on the card. And if you want it private, we'll keep it private. If you want, uh, to, want us to share that widely, we will be happy to do that as well. And we'll be praying about those as early as this afternoon. So go ahead and fill that out and put those in the collection plate. Hey, would you stand up with me? And uh, let me share a scripture with you as we get started here from the book of Hebrews that talks about how we've got this assurance from our God that we can be confident God's spirit is a part of our lives and blessing us. Listen to this from Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with sincere hearts in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and hang, having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. That's the assurance we rest in today. God's spirit is here with us. Let's praise this God for this assurance that we have. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. A heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his 
for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All teaching, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Be seated as we take our offering. 
As your children gather in peace, all the angels sing in heaven. In your temple, all that I seek is to glimpse your holy presence. All the We have a scripture reading before the communion this morning. And just to give you the context, uh, 
Christ has been arrested. He's been convicted and crucified. And this is the third day, and he's risen. And they've been to the tomb and, and haven't seen him, but have been told by angels he's alive. And you can imagine in Jerusalem, it's all a buzz, right? Particularly with those that were any kind of followers. So here we are in Luke 24, 13. 24, 13, I'm going to read all the way through 32, actually. So now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And he said to them, How foolish are you and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I'm going to continue. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning with us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? We take this communion this morning. I, I want to focus on those last couple of verses there. When he, when he sat at the table and broke the bread, and that was a meal, but that was when they recognized him. You know, we're on a road of life all the time, and we have so many things going on and so many confusions and so many entanglements with the material world that we often forget. We know that we forget and how foolish we can be sometimes such that we need this communion to remember and to recognize Jesus. Would you bow with me? Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be called your children. We are so grateful for this time that we can remember your son, remember his willingness to come, his patience with us as he taught us, and his mercy and your mercy as it continues. We're grateful for his body, for this bread that represents that, and the opportunity to sit and reflect and remember the great sacrifice that was given for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the blood that washes us from our sins. We need your mercy and grace every day. Help us to remember all the blood that was shed for just for us as we take this through the vine. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
He did. Hey, let's, uh, let's pray after that. It's powerful. Holy Father, we pray that the words that we just sang will be true, not just in, well, true in all the earth, but true in the little part of the earth that we occupy, that we will glorify your name in our lives this afternoon and tomorrow and tomorrow night and, and wherever we happen to be, whether we're walking a hallway at school or we are driving to work in traffic or sitting at our desks or working at our stations at the plant or wherever we are uh, in our neighborhoods, that we will glorify your name in that part of the earth. And in that way, may your name be glorified in all of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I want to uh, give you a quick reminder. We've got a, a, a couple of really great outreach events that are happening this week. They're actually not events. They're ongoing kinds of things. First, tonight at 6 o'clock, um, our, our Jobs for Life team is going to meet. They're going to meet at Panera Bread on Airport, 6 o'clock tonight, and do some of their final planning. If you are interested in working with them, they are looking right now for people who can be champions. And uh, the role of the champion is to walk alongside people who are going through the Jobs for Life classes and just encourage them. Just be a positive, encouraging presence in their lives. You don't, you don't have to have any special um, occupational skills for that. You do have to be willing to commit to somebody and walk with them and just be a resource for them and an encouragement to them. But uh, th they'll be meeting tonight, 6 o'clock, uh, Panera Bread, Airport Road. Uh, I think, Dan, you'll buy them dinner, right? Is that what you said? You, Dan will now buy you dinner, okay? <laughs> give, me the, give me the bill. We'll take care of that. But uh, they would love to have you be a part of that, and that'd be a great opportunity for you to, to be involved in some outreach to help somebody. Also, this Wednesday night, uh, it, was, we, we were, it was supposed to be the second night, but we, were, we had to cancel last week because of weather. But this coming Wednesday night, Stephen and Clark are beginning their ministry of working with family members uh, of those who are addicted to drugs and alcohol. And they're going to be providing a sort of a support group and an encouragement group and a resource group for uh, family members of those who are struggling with alcohol or drug addiction. And so we just pray for Steve and Ann, and if you'd like to be a part of that, get in touch with them. And if you know somebody that has family members that are struggling with those terrible addictions, get them in touch with Steve and Ann. This would be a great resource for folks. Wanted to mention those two things to you so that you can be praying about them and get involved in them as we go. So um, every year, Collins Dictionary selects uh, one word or phrase that seemed to dominate the international conversation and names it the word of the year. In 2014, the word of the year was photobomb. Okay, that's, that's when somebody ruins a picture uh, by unexpectedly appearing in the camera frame. Um, I get that every time I take a picture. Anybody takes a picture of me, it's a photobomb because I ruin it every time. 2015, the word was binge watch. That's watching multiple episodes of a television series, typically using Netflix or some other streaming service. I did that with The Walking Dead until I got really tired of it because it was the same thing over and over and over. And then I recently did that with Longmire, which was awesome, right? So binge watching. 2016, the word was Brexit, uh, referring to Britain's exit from the EU. And you want to guess what the word for 2017 is? Somebody looked at the bulletin. Fake news, defined as false, often sensational information disseminated under the guise of news reporting, which is pretty much all of it these days, right? Here's the thing. Fake news, it's the word of the year for 2017, but it's not new. Fake news is very, very old, 1,300 years before Jesus, an Egyptian pharaoh named Ramses the Great commissioned artwork depicting his single-handed victory over the Hittites at the Battle of Kadesh. Here's the thing. The Egyptians didn't win that battle. 
at the very best, it was a draw. And then, and then in the first century before Jesus, before Jesus, Octavian ran a fake news campaign against his rival, Mark Antony, who ultimately committed suicide because Cleopatra down in Egypt did some fake news that she had committed suicide and Mark Antony was in love with her, so he committed suicide. Totally not true. But fake news is really old. The invention of the printing press in 1439. I'm reading Eric Metaxas' biography of Luther right now. And one of the, one of the things that, that kind of would get out of hand back in those days was when somebody published a document, somebody else would take it and just start printing it like mad without even asking the author and changing things in it. And so there was a lot of fake news blowing around because of the, the, the invention of the printing press. In the 20th century, the Nazis... Uh, established the Reich Ministry for Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. If Google is telling us the truth, and I really hope it is, because I'd hate to put something dirty in German up on the screen, but I think that means the enemy will be smashed into dust, big Germany. Everything that was published in Germany, in, in every media, went through the Reich uh, Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, and truth and reporting was not a very high priority for them. So regardless of who you think is faking the news these days, it's not new. It's very old. Here's the question that we're dealing with right now, this morning here. Is the message of the Bible fake news, or is it fact? Last week, we, we began a series called Text Message. It is written in Scripture, but is it true? Is, is the text of the Bible the Word of God? Is it reliable? Can we trust it? Is it true? And last week we talked about how the first Christians viewed the Scriptures, and we noted that, that whenever they encountered a leadership vacuum or a credibility crisis or a challenge to their faith or an opportunity to share Jesus, they consistently turned to the Scriptures to formulate a response, to find an answer, to solve a problem, to step up to the challenge. They relied heavenly on the written Word of Scripture, and they viewed that as the Word of God. And then we we ask, where did they learn to do that? And one of the primary teachers of that was Jesus himself. When he was tempted by Satan, Jesus responded, it is written. When he was challenged by opponents, he responded to their questions with a question of his own, had you not read? And he was referring to the book of Moses. Even when he was dying on the cross, De Jesus quoted David's Psalm 22 to express his sense of abandon abandonment by, by God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't, I don't know that I said this last week, but th this was the implication. And this is, this is a strong implication, a powerful statement. Jesus, and it's absolutely true, Jesus regarded the human words of Scripture as his Father's speech. And I want to say that again because I, I want you to really hear what we're, what we're putting out there. Jesus regarded the human words of Scripture as his Father's, God's speech. Jesus and the earliest Christians had tremendous confidence in the Scriptures. So why did they trust them? And why should we? I want you to look with me in, in 2 Peter chapter 1. And 2 Peter is all the way near the end of the, end of the Bible. Go to Revelation and back up a little bit. And I mentioned last week, 66 books in the Bible, uh, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. Most of the books of the Bible are divided into chapters and verses. Some only have one chapter because they're so short. But most are divided into chapters and verses. So we are in the second book of Peter, chapter 1. And we're going to begin in just a second in uh, verse 12. But let me set it up for you. The first two verses... In 2 Peter chapter 1 are introductory and identifying Peter as the author and addressing the readers in typical fashion, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Verses 3 through 11, which are an absolute, absolutely elegantly written section of Scripture, just really beautiful, verses 3 through 11. P Peter basically says, I want to remind you of what God has done for you and what your response to what God has done needs to be. Very, very beautiful section of Scripture there that we will come back to another time. But, uh, but, but then in verse 12, 
he, he's obviously talking to them about some stuff that's not new information for them. Okay, because he says, I will always remind you of these things even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. And then again in verse 15, he says, I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to, re to remember these things. So the, the first reason we can trust the Bible comes in, in between those two verses, verses 13 and 14. Listen to this. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that soon I will put it aside as our Lord Christ has made clear to me. What, what's he saying? He's saying that he's going to die soon. He's saying, I'm going to die soon. I'm writing these things down, and I'm going to write some more because I know that I'm not going to be around all that much longer to encourage you. Some people think that the more Peter intended to write was actually turned out to be the gospel of Mark. Um, people, a lot of folks think, and I'm inclined to agree with this, that the gospel of Mark are really the reflections of Peter that Mark wrote down. Uh, nobody really knows that for sure, but that's, that's a supposition. So the interesting thing here is that Peter says, I know I'm about to die. And what's more, Jesus has made this very clear to me. He may be referring to some kind of recent revelation that Jesus gave him, um, or he could be talking about something that John records in the Gospel of John chapter 21, verses 18 and 19. After the resurrection, Jesus and Peter are walking beside the Sea of Galilee. And then Jesus says to Peter, very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. When you were older, someone, you, you will stretch out your hands, someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And then John adds in verse 19, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. That phrase, stretch out your hands, is a euphemism for crucifixion. So now Peter is old when he writes this letter, and he knows that the prophecy of Jesus is soon to come true. So, so what does that have to do with whether the Bible is fake news or fact? Just this, and I'm phrasing this next sentence very carefully. He says, the, 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 the reason that this matters, the reason that, that when Peter says, I'm going to die very soon, the reason it matters whether the, the Bible is fake or fact is this. Most people, most people are not willing to die for what they know is a lie. Peter's just said, I'm, I'm ready to die for this, and I'm telling you that most people are not willing to die for what they know is a lie. Now, I, want, I phrase that carefully for two reasons. First, the truth is people die for lies all the time. The, those men who flew jetliners into the World Trade Centers and into the Pentagon and into that field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania on September 11th, 2001, those terrorists died for a lie. They believed their cause was true. But I, I think it's fair and, and honest for us to, to point out that just because somebody's willing to die for something does not make that thing a fact. It says a lot about their courage and their commitment. The second reason I want to phrase this carefully is because we don't really know for sure how Peter died. Tradition has it that he was, in fact, crucified by Nero around 64 AD and that he was crucified upside down. Um, and there, there, there's good reason to trust the sources that tell us that, but we can't be entirely sure that's what happened. Here's, a, here's the thing, though. We do have clear historical evidence from the enemies of Christianity that Christians were persecuted for their beliefs. That matters because when your enemy confirms something that you claim, it's kind of like having a prosecution witness testify for the defense, right? Let me give you one example of that. Now, um, in, in the years 110 to 113, this is about 80 years after Jesus has died, there was a man named Pliny the Younger 
who was governor of the Roman province of Bithynia in what is, what is now in northern, northwest Turkey. Pliny, P-L-I-N-Y, is how you spell his name, wrote dozens of letters to Emperor Trajan about everything from whether to, to permit a local city to uh, remodel its, its public bathhouse uh, to whether another town could set up a 150-man fire brigade. They'd had a big fire, and he wanted to know, can we set up a fire brigade for that town? Trajan, by the way, approved the bathhouse, but disallowed the fire brigade. He said that if you let 150 men get together on a regular basis to train to put out fires, they'll become what he called a dangerous secret society. The Romans were notoriously afraid of groups that met together on a regular basis. Hence, one of their problems with Christians. So in one of his letters to Trajan, Pliny writes seeking guidance from the emperor on how to handle what he called the contagion of this superstition. I just want, you to, want to read a little bit of this to you. Okay, what, I'm, what, I'm, what we're talking about here is how the fact that there were people who were willing to die for what they believed to be the truth and that most people are not going to die for what they know is a lie. So listen to this. Pliny writes to Trajan, it's my practice, my Lord, to refer to you all matters concerning which I am in doubt, for who can better give guidance to my hesitation or inform my ignorance? Brown nosing is very old too. I have never participated in the trials of Christians. I therefore do not know what offenses it is the practice to punish or investigate and to what extent. And I have been not a little hesitant as to whether there should be any distinction on account of age or no difference between the very young and the very mature, which is interesting to me because what that means is that there were some teenagers that Pliny was dealing with, and he didn't know whether you guys should be treated the same as some of them or not. There were youth groups in the church in Bithynia, and they were standing for Christ, and Pliny didn't know what to do with them. Kind of interesting. Whether pardon is to be granted for repentance, or if a person has once been a Christian, it does them no good to have ceased to be one, whether the name itself, even without offenses, or only the offenses associated with the name are to be punished. Meanwhile, in the case of those who were denounced to me as Christians, I have observed the following procedure. I interrogated these as to whether they were Christians. Those who confessed, I interrogated a second and a third time, threatening them with punishment. Those who persisted, I ordered executed. For I had no doubt that whatever the nature of their creed, stubbornness and inflexible obstinacy surely deserved to be punished. There were others possessed of the same folly, but because they were Roman citizens, I signed them over to be transferred to Rome, which sounds a little bit like what Paul went through when he was being tried before a provincial governor. Soon accusations spread, as usually happens, because of the proceedings going on, and several incidents occurred. An anonymous document was published containing the names of many persons, those who denied that they were or had been Christians, when they invoked the gods in words dictated by me, offered prayer and incense with wine to your image, which I ordered to be brought for this very purpose with the statues of the gods, and moreover, when they cursed Christ, none of which those who are really Christians, it is said, can be forced to do, these I thought should be discharged. Others named by the informer declared that they were Christians, but then denied it, asserting that they had been but had ceased to be Christians some three years before, others many years, some as much as 25 years before. They all worshipped your image and the statues of the gods and cursed Christ. He goes on to say that in order to get to the bottom of this, he tortured two female slaves who were called deaconesses, but I discovered nothing else but depraved and excessive superstition. He concludes... I therefore postpone the investigation and hasten to consult you, for the matter seemed to me to warrant consulting you, especially because the number involved, for many persons of every age, every rank, and both sexes are and will be endangered, for the contagion of this superstition has spread not only to the cities, but also to the villages and the farms. It is a fascinating document and sobering when you realize that at this very moment there are men and women and boys and girls who are standing before people just like Pliny 
and being challenged to curse Christ or die. All by itself, the fact that many people who stood in Pliny's court were willing to die for what they believed does not make what they believed the truth. It says a lot more about their convictions and courage than whether the news about Jesus was fake or fact. But here's the thing. The people that I just read to you about lived very close to the events that occurred in, 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 that are described in Scripture, barely 80 years removed from Jesus. The Christians who died at the hands of Nero in the 60s were closer still. They may not have been there when the cross was dropped into the hole. They may not have been there when the stone was rolled away from the tomb. They may not have been there when Jesus appeared to people over the next 40 days, but they heard from people who had been there, and that testimony was enough to cause them to hold a position that wasn't just unpopular, but deadly and dangerous. Most people are not willing to die for what they know is a lie. And yet a lot of people, Peter included, were willing to die. It is not irrefutable proof that the scripture is fact, not fake, but it is extremely compelling. And then Peter gives us a second reason that we can believe that the Bible is not fake news, but, but rather fact, eyewitness testimony. Look at verses 16 through 18, 2 Peter chapter one. For we do not follow cleverly devised stories when we, were, when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. We ourselves heard the voice that came from heaven and we were with him on the sacred mountain. That phrase, cleverly devised, literally means deceitfully concocted. And the word stories, in Greek is mythos. We did not come up with deceitfully concocted myths, fictions. We're not making this stuff up. We saw it with our own eyes. We heard it with our own ears. We were there, Peter says. And he's not the only writer to make that claim. First John, chapter one, verse one, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, which our hands have handled, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. John says, we heard it with our own ears, we saw it with our own eyes, we touched him with our own hands. Here's another one, Luke chapter one. This is interesting because Luke was not an eyewitness, but listen to what he says. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Then he says, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of what you've been taught. Luke's purpose in writing was to provide assurance that what he had been taught about Jesus, what, what, what uh, Theophilus had been taught about Jesus was the truth. He never, Luke never personally saw Jesus, but he investigated what he had heard. He interviewed eyewitnesses. He consulted sources. If you were trying to provide certainty that an assertion is true, it would be supremely counterproductive to trot out a bunch of false statements that could very easily be refuted by the people who were there. Here's another one. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8. Listen to Paul. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, uh, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's another name for Peter, and then the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, some of them are dead. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all to me, as to one abnormally born or born a a a out of time. Paul is saying, look, check it out. There are people who can verify what I'm telling you. They were there. They saw it. A lot of them are still alive. Look them up. Eyewitnesses. In his book, The Reason for God, Tim Keller writes about the reliability of the Bible. He points out that the Bible includes odd little details 
unnecessary details that are best explained as the observations of eyewitnesses. For example, in Mark chapter 4, Mark says that Jesus was asleep on a cushion in the stern of a boat. That sounds like the kind of thing that Peter might have said. You know, we were in the boat, he was asleep in the back on a cushion. And so Mark wrote that down. John 21, John says that Peter was 100 yards out in the water in a boat when he sees Jesus on the beach. That he ties his shirt around his waist, jumps in and swims to shore. And then they catch 153 fish. And John adds, you know, they were large fish. Acts chapter 2, Luke tells us that it was 9 in the morning when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles in power. In Acts chapter 3, it was 3 in the afternoon when Peter and John went up to the temple and pray. In Acts chapter 20, Paul preaches until midnight. There were a lot of lamps in the room. There was a young man named Eutychus sitting in a high window. He fell asleep. He fell to the ground and died. Are you people on the balcony getting this? <laughs> if you're making up a story... Why do you include details like what Jesus slept on and how many fish were caught and the size of the fish, along with names and times and places and dates, all which can be easily checked? You know, maybe the reason people were willing to die for what they believed was precisely because many of them had seen it with their own eyes or they heard it from people who had been there. So people were willing to die for this. There were eyewitnesses who were there. And then Peter gives us one more reason to trust that what we read in the text of the Bible is fact, not fake. Look at verses 19 through 21. We also, this is 2 Peter chapter 1, 19 through 21. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will. The prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter makes an astonishing claim here. When we read the Scriptures, we are reading a document that is at once human and divine. It was written by human beings in their own languages, styles, contexts, cultures, but its origin was from God himself. And the agent carrying along the human writers was God's Holy Spirit. N.T. Wright said that the scriptures are one of the points, and I love this quote, are one of the points where heaven and earth overlap and interlock. The Apostle Paul described this activity in the last book he wrote, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. He told Timothy, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Traditionally, this concept has been called inspiration. It's, which is a, a very fine word. The problem with that is that we can easily slip into talking about the effect the Bible has when Peter and Paul are really talking about where the Bible comes from. They're not talking about effect when they use the word inspiration or when they say the, that holy people of God were carried along by the Holy Spirit. They're talking about origin. We use the word inspiring for all kinds of things when we want to describe how something impacts us. It is common for Lisa to step out our back door and then say to me, hey, you need to come out here and see the moon rising over the mountain. Or for me to step out and say to her, hey, you need to come out here and look at this sunset. To say that the moon rising over Green Mountain or the sun setting on the Tennessee River is inspiring is to talk about how those beautiful scenes affect us. You can say the same thing about a symphony a painting, a speech, the throaty growl that you get when you mash the accelerator of a 460 horsepower, five liter V8 Mustang with active performance enhancement. That's what I'm talking about. Imagine how fast I can spread the gospel with one of those. Wow. 
The Bible can be inspiring in that sense. But when Paul uses the word God breathed, when Peter says the writers of Scripture were carried along by the Holy Spirit, they're not talking about effect. They're telling us where Scripture comes from. It is, they say, breathed out by God. It is not made up. It is not concocted. It is not imagined. It is not just a good story. It is not just a human document. It is not fake news. It is what God wanted to say to us. It is what God wants to say to us. And it is true. Now the neat thing is that both Paul and Peter do talk about the effect Scripture has. Which is why what we're doing this year reading through the word together trying to get in the word in 2018 can be so powerful for us because the word does have a powerful effect and both peter and paul talk about that peter says that if we pay attention to it the day for us will dawn and the morning star will rise in our hearts most scholars believe the morning star refers to jesus you pay attention to scripture Jesus will rise up in your heart. Then Paul says that Scripture teaches and rebukes and corrects and trains. Why? So that we can participate with God in what he is doing in the world. N.T. Wright again says, Scripture is there to enable us to glimpse the task before us and to become the sort of people through whom that task can be attempted and accomplished. I want to be a part of what God is doing in this world. I want to to be in on that. That's truth. That's real. That's fact. And I want to be in on it. And the way for me to be in on it, to be prepared for it, to be able to see it, to be able to participate in it, is to stay in the Word of God. God, a long time ago, carried a man named David along, inspired him to write a very beautiful prayer that we'll close with this morning, both in your hearing and in our singing. It's in Psalm 51. God inspired David with these, to, to write these words, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Would you go ahead and stand with me, please, as we finish this verse? Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Read this last part with me, will you? Verse 12, let's go. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Let's sing together. Create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew Would you please bow with me? Father God, we are 
grateful and thankful to be adopted as your sons and daughters. We're thankful that your love endures forever. and We believe in the blessed assurance of Jesus, our Redeemer. Father, we believe in answered prayer. We ask you to bless all the marriages at Twickenham. Ask you to enter into all of the hearts that you would turn stone into flesh and you would heal the marriages here at Twickenham Church of Christ and in all of our country. Be with our leaders of our country, Father God. Whew, give them wisdom. <laughs> give them discernment. It is in short supply. Please be with them. And we are so thankful, Father, that your word is in our hearts and it is not fake news, but your word is the gospel breathed from your very lips. Be with all the leaders here at Twickenham, Father God. Be with Jody and Lisa and Caleb and Ashley and Lincoln and Amy and Stephen Ann and all of the staff and the elders and the teachers and all the ministry leaders. Give, give us wisdom, give us discernment and create in us a pure heart that in all we say, think and do, we bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name. The whole church says, amen. amen.